growth of the women's suffrage movement and is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to the democratic system of government. Citizen participation in government is basic to the democratic process and the cornerstone of the league's purpose. And we have representatives from both groups here tonight. If you'd like to speak to them, we'll be out in the lobby. Um, and so what we uh, planned to do tonight was, this is not a debate, this is just um, an opportunity for people to get to know the Assembly and Senate candidates that are running this um, election, and uh, provide an opportunity for you to ask questions about some of the issues you're concerned about. Uh, one of the problems with elections today is you don't really hear a lot about issues. You hear about what somebody did or what somebody doesn't do. We're not interested in hearing that tonight. And we're interested in hearing what someone plans to do or what they'd like to do. So um, we're going to ask to the people not address the candidates specifically or you know personally. Um, if you didn't get an index card out front, I'm going to have members of BCW in the aisles, um, and we'll have business, the index cards available. If you picked up a blank one and want to turn it in, just hold it up and some for a minute, and someone will catch it and uh, bring it up to our moderator. Um, the, the candidates will not be interacting amongst each other as well. What we're doing is we're asking questions of the candidates individually, and um, they will be timing their answers. Um, they'll have three minutes to answer. Um, introductions, we'll start with introductions, which will be five minutes from each candidate for them to talk about their issues and present their platforms. Okay, does anybody have any questions right now before we continue? Okay, and as I said, um, Elaine Lapeer is one of our BPW members. She's in the back. You could wave, Elaine. Um, she's one of the people that will have index cards available. If you want to raise your hand, if you'd like an index card, if a question comes up, or if you want to hold your card up. Um, Susan Kelly is coming down the aisle right now. Susan Kelly is another BPW member. I will be in the aisles too as well. Okay, so flag one of us down. We'd be happy to help you. Um, we're going to, it's a little warm in here, so we're going to be having an intermission about 7 o'clock. I'll leave that up to the moderator when the appropriate time is, and uh, get, let everyone get a, breath, a fresh air. During that time, too, if you'd like to speak to some of the other candidates that are present, present here tonight that are not participating, um, we had to keep it kind of down to a minimum, so we have the Assembly and Senate that we're focusing it on tonight. But um, we also have uh, Bernie Bassett from the town of Plattsburgh. Democratic candidate for supervisor, down in the front there. Um, and we also have um, Dale Sears, who's running for supervisor as well for the Republicans, right next to Bernie. Um, we also have Jerry Renadette, who's running for town of Plattsburgh Council. And we also have a mayoral candidate, Kevin Donahoe, who's running for the Democratic Party. If you have any questions of these candidates, they're here for your um, they're here to, for you to access and discuss candidate issues with them. Okay? And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our moderator for the evening, Dr. Maurice Mohickey of Clinton Community College. He's our, the president and will be moderating this evening. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. We will be going alphabetical for the introductions. Each of the candidates will have five minutes to do their introduction. We will have a two-minute warning and then a 30-second warning held up, and I'll be looking for those to remind each of the candidates. And uh, we have some questions that are specific to candidates, and we have some general questions for everyone. Before the introduction, though, I have a question that says, will both candidates agree to future debates? Seeing how this isn't a debate, um, I'm not sure it's even appropriate at this point, but. Uh, would the candidates be interested in debating in the future? Absolutely. Over here. Yes, sir. So there's the answer to that question. That all debate sometime in the future, but not tonight. <laughs> okay, for our first introduction, Senator Betty Lowe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hickey. Thank you. And thanks to all who have come here tonight. I've had the privilege and the honor of serving in the New York State Senate for the last three and a half years and representing the people of the 45th Senate District. And truly it has been an honor. It's a privilege to serve people. It's a privilege to have their support. And I hopefully have worked hard to represent them. As a state senator, I've introduced and had ideas for many pieces of legislation, 
many of which have become law. And in order to get those pieces of legislation, I've worked with the communities, with the supervisors and with the legislators in all of our towns and villages throughout the 45th district. I've also worked hard with them to secure millions of dollars of funding, dollars that have helped our hospitals, nursing homes, schools, libraries, and many other not-for-profit organizations that serve and are in our area, and particularly SUNY Plattsburgh as a college and Clinton Community College as well. But in my tenure as a legislator, my priority has always been constituent service. And I believe that we have helped hundreds, if not thousands, of people access and work through the bureaucracy of the New York State agencies and to help them with their issues. Yes, there are times when we can't offer any additional help, but we do our very best to serve people and to help them with their issues and with their problems. The 45th Senate District is very large, 7,800 square miles. I represent Ward, Washington, Essex, Clinton, Hamilton, and Franklin counties. Um, within that, I have many towns and villages, municipalities, and school districts. And there are many issues that are really universal to all of the people within the district. And certainly one of those that rises to the level of a very, very major priority this year is property tax reform. I have led the way in the Senate with many initiatives to help reform the system, the property tax system in New York State, to try to find some alternative funding for schools to relieve the property taxes so people do not have to move out of their home because their taxes are too high. I've worked with several groups. I've talked to taxpayer groups throughout the area. And in, after all of these initiatives, I think that one of the most important ones that I have is a bill that has a blue ribbon commission that has nine experts who will sit down and meet throughout the state, look at what other states do, and come up with a better system for funding our schools and our government than the current property tax system that we have. It has a sponsor in the Assembly. We were able to pass it in the Senate this year. I'm very hopeful that Assemblywoman Sandy Galef will be able to pass it in the um, Assembly this coming year. Throughout my tenure, I believe I've been a strong voice for the North Country and worked together with all legislators on both sides of the aisles to achieve results. I would not be standing here tonight asking for your support for another term if I did not believe and was not thoroughly confident that I have come up with results for this area. I have made a difference as a legislator, and I hope to be able to continue to do so if I have your support in the coming election. Thank you very much. Hello. It is uh, really great to see people show up when it's still summertime because they care so much about what happens in our garden. The League of Women Voters, the, the BPW, have done such a magnificent job of keeping the issues and keeping the concerns at the forefront and bringing people together. I'll tell you, it is a large district, Betty. We have been traveling up and down many counties, many highways, and I keep hearing the same thing. We must have change. What we have right now is not working. Twelve years ago, Governor Pataki came and said he was going to cut government spending. Betty Little came ten years ago with the same promise. The Republicans in the Senate have stopped reform at every turn. We need so much more than handouts from our government up here. We need real initiatives. We need jobs, not jobs purchased on a state dole, like the one in Malta that will cost $1 million per job. We do need property tax reform. Someone here once said to a group of property tax owners in Queensbury, if they didn't like their high taxes, they could sell their homes. This is not the solution. I have a plan for property tax reform. I call it the, the family home protection plan. It's reasonable. It does not take money out of the state coffers. It does not, it's not a shell game. 
where the government says, here, we're going to give you a tax break, and then over here, they take the money back out again. It's time that we have not creative accounting, but real solutions. I look very much forward to the rest of this race and to serving you in ways that are positive, productive, and create your reform. The best news I have for all of you right now comes down to two words. It's Elliot Spitzer. He's a, he's a man who's got guts and he's got gumption. He's not afraid to look people who are powerful, who have moneyed interests behind them, and say, no. He's endorsed my campaign because he knows that together we can work with the hard work, not just to reform Albany, but to bring initiatives to North Country, which are more than just the scraps from our table, more than just the door that will keep us with our hands out year after year. So, what do we need? We need jobs. We need lower property taxes. We need the respect that upstate is just as important as downstate. We need to be able to sit down at the end of the day and say, you know what? We've done our job. We worked hard. We fed our family. We educated our kids. And we look forward to retirement with a certain level of security. Something that we haven't been getting. Something that all of us are worried about. I know a woman in Essex County who's 83 who just went back to work. She's working hard to the Democratic Party right now. She knows that change is necessary. I think you know it too. I think that's why you're here. And that's why I'm trying to give you. Thanks for coming. Thank you all for coming here tonight. It's a privilege and an honor to be before you this evening. Um, as you know, I'm Andrew Brockway. I am 25 years old and I live in the town of Plattsburgh and it's great to be home. Uh, back in 2004, I worked for Senator Hillary Robin Clinton in Washington, D.C. I worked for Lieutenant Colonel Paul Pelosi on foreign affairs, mostly focusing on the 9-11 Commission report. Folks, I'd like to begin tonight by stating that I offer a campaign on the ideas. I think that that's what we, as candidates for public office, owe the residents of the North Country. Much has been debated recently in regards to my age and the experience of all three candidates running for assembly before you here this evening. This, in my opinion, is a wasted opportunity. One of my opponents was quoted last week as saying that I do not have the experience that qualifies me to run for office. This is a copy of the New York State Constitution that says that I was qualified to run for assembly seven years ago when I turned 18. However, that's not why we're here tonight. My point is that we're wasting a perfect opportunity in this campaign to discuss our community's future. Instead, we are reflecting on our past. I offer a common sense approach to problems facing our community that will result in benefits to people from all walks of life. The first issue on my agenda is Medicaid reform. Currently, it occupies about 60 to 65 percent of Clinton and Franklin County budgets, severely hamstringing their ability to offer additional services. A total state takeover of Medicaid will free this money up for uh, increased services, property tax reduction, and will allow our governments to have extra funds for re uh, revitalizing our economy. We must also retain our college graduates. Candidates entering fields such as nursing, teachers, and social work are at a premium in the North Country. Fletcher Allen in Vermont is taking nurses from CBPH and Alice Hyde because they offer a loan forgiveness program. I've submitted an editorial to both the Adirondack Daily Enterprise and the Moral Telegram. It has yet to be published in the press, Republican, but we need to adopt a similar opportunity for our graduates in New York State so that we can continue to have these people to make the North Country their home. My Democratic opponent, while I commend him for running, is proposing a plan that, in my opinion, will hurt our ability to reclaim our status as the Empire State. He is offering a cap on property set taxes at 2.5%. Gas prices are up by more than 10% this year and the rate of infl inflation is currently over 4%. We should not be choosing whether or not we're going to drive our school buses or whether or not we're going to educate our children. 
nor should we be choosing whether or not we're going to increase our staffing at nursing homes or if we're going to pay for heating fuel. The state takeover of Medicaid will allow local governments to continue providing services, reduce property taxes, and free up money for economic revitalization so that we may create and retain jobs, good paying jobs in the North Country. Folks, I will not back away from this fight because I believe that the North Country is worth fighting for. It won't be easy, change never is. But a vote, a vote, but a vote for Andrew Brock on September 12th and on November 7th is a vote for hope, vision, and change. I ask you to spread my message and join my vision and my quest for a revitalized community. Thank you once again for being here this evening. It's been both a privilege and an honor, and I look forward to continuing this quest for change. Thank you very much. Our next candidate is Mrs. Chan Cooper. Thank you. And thank you for coming. It's a pleasure for me to be here this evening. I was the first woman elected to the Clinton County Legislature in 1975. I held a position on the board for 10 years, chaired it for a couple of years. And as I got the last email talking about this evening's event and the fact that the, date, the reason the date was selected was because of Equality Day, I actually searched back through some records of mine to see what the dates were when I was first approached by the people who were then called matrons in the county jail. And these uh, female employees advised me at that time that they were being paid four pay scale grades under their male counterparts, the male correction officers. And in addition to guarding prisoners, they were also doing all of the dispatching and when the cook wasn't available, they were doing the cooking. So it took a few months of uh, negotiating and discussing with my nine male colleagues at the time, all of whom were very good men, to convince them that in fact this was an absolute atrocious situation. And I was able to, and proudly able to introduce a resolution that put the female correction officers on a par with the male correction officers at the same scale and in fact also reimbursed them for their uniforms as they had never been. And I noted that the date that that was done was April 27th, 1980. So I uh, didn't realize at the time I was hitting so close to Equality Day, but it's something I'm very proud of having accomplished. I was the first woman elected to a countywide office when I became treasurer in 1986. For the past 20 years, the county has had clean audits, both by the state comptroller and various independent auditors. In 2004, I was honored by my colleagues across the state as the New York State Finance Official of the Year. There's no doubt the number one issue facing the residents of the state of New York in the 114th Assembly District of Real Property Taxes. The county treasurer knows the issues of real property taxes better than anybody else in the county. I deal with it on a daily basis, talking to people about their concerns of their increased assessments and escalating taxes. I look them in the eye as they talk about their concerns and worries of losing their homes and how they're going to meet their tax bills. Taxpayers' organizations throughout the district and the state are demanding relief, and I am sure they're going to get it. Albany is finally listening. Senator Little has proposed some excellent legislation, as has Assemblywoman Teresa Sayward. In the upcoming session, I believe this issue is going to be addressed. Serious real property tax reform is going to take place. And I can assure you that I have the experience with taxpayers, with the Office of Real Property Tax Services, to sit at the table, to serve as a consensus builder, and to help to solve the problem. The system is broken. I'm really looking for the opportunity to be a part of the fix. Broadband service is something that's needed throughout the North Country. Congressman McHugh gave us a great announcement today. We also need a state commitment to determine the location of fiber that has already been installed, to look at where new fiber must be installed, linking the two and working with private companies to get the last mile to provide broadband, not only for the high-tech businesses we want to attract here, but for the businesses that are already here, our residents, our hospitals, and our educational facilities. Certainly, even perhaps more important is the issue of cell phone access. 
not just because businesses need it and residents want it, but because it's a necessity in today's world for the quality of life and the safety of our residents. I've worked on budgets, county budgets of over $100 million for the last 30 years. I know how the funding works from the federal government to the state government to local municipalities. I have the appropriate experience to take to Albany to discuss the issues. I'm a proven consensus builder. I can hit the ground running with the knowledge of the systems, procedures, and issues. Thank you. Now we'll begin the question phase. No. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I apologize. We have a four candidates. Got ahead of myself. Mr. Captain Nichol. Good evening. I would like to thank uh, the uh, League of Women Voters and the uh, Professional Business Women's Association for uh, providing this forum. Uh, it is tough to get people in a hot auditorium on a summer night, and uh, it does show the concern of uh, the voters here tonight, and I, I greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure the other candidates do as well. As most said, my name is Kevin Nichols, and I'm running for the 114th Assembly District. I'm running because this office for too long has been ineffective in representation for this district. For too long, our elected representative of the Assembly in, in Albany was either unwilling or unable to secure for our district the most basic foundations for economic development. We've been underrepresented, overtaxed, and forgotten. All they need decides that the counties in this district are required to fund whatever mandate they seem fit, as our representatives in the Assembly have done nothing to stop this drain on our taxpayers. While virtually every other assembly district has been supported by the assembly in creating a fiber optic broadband network, we have been ignored. While the ultra wealthy come to our district to buy expensive second homes, our neighbors become overburdened by the property tax assessment scheme. When middle class families are without means to pay for college, Albany cuts their funding. When Albany requires owners of snowmobiles and ATVs to pay registration fees, uh, registration fees to create trails, they demonstrate their arrogance by stealing those funds from them, from us and sticking them in their poor trail. As a person who has paid those registration fees only to see them taken from us, as a taxpayer who has seen our family's home increase in value only in the government's eyes, as a father who is concerned that the rising cost of education will leave his children with an overly burdensome education debt, and as a small businessman who is concerned about the rising uncontrolled cost of doing business in the North Country, and as a North Country Democrat, who will have your voice heard in the Assembly. I'm running for this office because the career politicians and those who want to be career politicians either offer no hope of effective representation in the democratically controlled Assembly, or simply have no answers to our problems. I offer to the voters real experience for a new era. And I offer to the voters solutions, not rhetoric. In the first 30 days after I take office, I will introduce the legislation to fully fund the development of a fiber optic broadband network throughout this district. The development of this district is as necessary today as rural electrification was in the 1930s. Without this network, our district will be ignored by any business that might otherwise decide to come here to do business. With this network, we can create jobs to build and maintain the network. It will bring down the cost of communications drastically because it will introduce competition among the cable and phone monopolies currently controlling our communications. This fiber optic cable is the most fundamental tool we need to become competitive as a region in the new era of global competition. Without it, our communication infrastructure will remain decades behind all our regional neighbors. And just also, over in, in St. Lawrence, Jefferson, and Lewis County, they had that same fiber optic uh, network installed, and it was an appropriation from Albany in the amount of about $8 million. That brought another $12 million from private funding. And, and it's that kind of, that kind of public-private uh, uh, partnership that we need to have in order to uh, get this, this network up and running. And it's just, uh, it just has to happen. In the first 30 days after I take office, I will introduce legislation to stop these historic and astronomical increases in our property tax burden. And give back to the people the fundamental power to stop increases in our property tax burden by giving voters the right to reject any property tax increase over 2.5%. So when voters are given a tax bill that exceeds this 2.5% cap, they can go to the polls and tell the government, no, you won't raise my taxes. 
Now, I know this has been criticized, but there is no more effective uh, means of, of having government control their budget than by telling them, you've only got 2.5% to live on this year. While the rest of us all have to deal with rising tax costs, and while we have to deal with the rising gasoline prices, we can't sit at the end of the month when, when we're writing checks to people and say, oh, I don't have enough money, let me send a bill to so-and-so and they'll give you the money. Without this 2.5% cap, there will be no incentive at all for government to start trimming the budget. And, and this is the same uh, means that Elliot Spitzer uh, uh, intends to use, which is to control government spending, to bring the spending down. We all know, we all know that in, in government, there is waste in government. And I believe we can find 10% of the total state budget just wasted. That's, that's where the money has to come from, not the backs of the property owners. Not tax rebates uh, before election day, but because uh, I know Donald Trump got a lot more, will be getting a lot more money than I will on, on that tax rebate day before the election. That, that's not where uh, this money has to come from. The money should stay right here. We don't give it to the government if at the end of the year they're just going to give it back to us. That, that's just, uh, just an unfortunate uh, uh, shell game. I asked, okay. I asked the voters to hire me as the next member to the assembly. As a small business person and as a homeowner, I know the pains of paying taxes and working hard to help support not only my family, but also to support the families of 12 employees, providing health insurance, setting aside money in a retirement plan, not only for my family, but for families of those 12 people. As a holder of a master's degree, I can find a way to resource standing to the budget process in Albany, and I it's my training as a lawyer. I guess I'm getting dabbled down. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> Don't you forget me now, you're coming up. <laughs> not a very good question, thanks. I'll try to, uh, as the questions come through, spread them out so everyone gets an opportunity to answer the questions. The first one is for both our senatorial candidates. This is the question, I will leave it on the podium if you can have a reference down. And Senator Lee will give you the first opportunity to answer. The question is, will you support age-specific sex education in all schools? We have three minutes, and we'll give you a one minute and 30 second warning. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to make a clarification statement about a statement that was made earlier. I know of no legislator that would respond to someone who was concerned about their property taxes in that manner. And I'm committed to working very hard to see that we reform the property tax system in New York State. Uh, certainly we have some legislation that will allow school districts to apply for sex education funds, and I will support that among them. Dr. Mayor. Will I support age-specific sex education in all schools? I've got three minutes to say this. Yes. Okay. Our next question is for the assembly candidates, for all three of them. And Mr. Nichols, we'll allow you to go first. The question is, many residents feel that the New York State Legislature is out of touch with the needs of North Country residents. How will you keep in touch with the people who live here? Well, after I'm elected to the Assembly, I am still going to be living here. I expect uh, that the legislative season during the uh, budget process, which has been egregiously dysfunctional since this, the state legislature went full time, I believe. I was, in a, I was an intern in, in the assembly back in 1982 when I was going to Niagara University. And they were part-time legislators, and they got the budget done because, you know, at the end of the, uh, the season on, on March 31st, if the budget wasn't done, they were getting paid so that, you know, they just got the job done. If they could get the job done when they were part-time, they should be able to get the job done when they were full-time. But I expect, I, I'm involved in a number of organizations, I'm not, I'm not leaving the Boy Scouts, I'm not leaving uh, the, uh, the YMCA organization, I said on board, and, and also I'm on the North Country Foundation, North Country Community College Foundation, and these institutions of, of higher education are very important to me. I'm not going away, I'm going to be here. Uh, I'm going to have an office in Plattsburgh, I'll have an office in Malone, and I'm also going to have an office in Saranac Lake. 
So I will be in touch with, with each of these people. If we get this fiber optic cable, then I think we can have a webcast between my office and the district. But uh, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not something I've ever really considered as a problem because it's just not something that entered my mind. I, I live up here. I love it up here. It's God's country. And, and I'm going to say here, I'm not moving to all this. Thank you. I, I guess I'm pleased the first question is such an easy one. I've been a, an elected official for 30 years and I've been in touch with the people for the entire 30 years. I've spent a, a huge amount of time and, and I'm going to say absolutely delightful time traveling around Franklin County and and hitting every small town and, and attending many, many functions. And that's how you stay in touch with the voters. I think that any, I'm convinced anybody who runs for office has the responsibility to attend as many functions as possible, to reach out and, and have public forums for the, the elect, for the electorate, to be available. Again, participating in public services, something that I've done on community boards. I'm in my 12th year in the Champlain Valley Physicians Hospital uh, Board of Directors. I'm very proud to be a member of the Pine Harbor Board of Directors. So in October, we will be opening a assisted living in uh, Alzheimer's Center. And I'm going to stay on that board. This is a wonderful community. The ability to be able to represent this community in Albany and come back with a message and convey that message to the voters and listening to the voters' concerns, taking that those concerns back to Albany will just be a wonderful opportunity, and I can assure you that given that chance, people will see me every day, all the time. Well, much like Janice said, I plan on traveling the community. I've already been in every town in the district, and I think the best way to keep touch, in touch with the people is to be with the people as much as you can. Just the other day, I was at the adult center in Constable, and I uh, ate lunch with the senior citizens and uh, got roped into playing a couple games of bingo, but uh, I didn't win any money. But uh, I think that's the best way to keep in touch is to go to as many community events as you possibly can. And I've been to all the field days at the Redford uh, 15th celebration, um, and I plan on keeping in touch, in touch with the people as much as I can. And I think that's very important so that you know what their specific needs and concerns are. We have a very um, unique environment up here. We have different needs and concerns in Franklin County and Essex County than we do in Clinton. And uh, I think that we need to travel as much as we can so that we're well aware of what people want to see from their legislature. Um, also, I think that we need to save a little bit of money to our for our constituents, and I plan on having a traveling office. I don't think it's necessary to have three offices. I think that we can do much like a lot of legislatures do, and uh, legislators do, and have a traveling office and have public town hall meetings. Um, that's the way to go. Okay. So, thank you. This question is again for some for our candidates. And Dr. Merrick, you will have first opportunity. Do you think that you could help through legislation to improve the New York State Family Court and how? New York State Family Court. There's a difference between intent of law and letter of law. And there are so many times, and I'm sure Mr. Nichols could tell you about it, that we, we tend to err on the side of the letter of the law because we are so afraid of what comes back at us. It's getting back to the heart and we remember what is essential for our children. When we, when we take away our, our school funding or when we can't pass our, our school funding because our property taxes are so high, people are so irate, the backlash that we get for our children, when people are concerned about lawlessness, the lawlessness that is driven from a disparity between the have and the have not. We tend to put an overemphasis on penalty, on enforcement, and our families and our children suffer again. You know, so much attention has always been on fixing the problem or, or cleaning up after the problem is already there. Yes, we need a compassionate, 
steady family court. So many families don't get the help they need until they fall right there. And we need to pick them up with compassion, but we need to do more than that. We need to prevent families from having to work three and four and five jobs so they don't spend time with their children, so that these issues come up. So many families are having to choose between feeding themselves, heating oil, gasoline to get to a job, property taxes. It's no wonder the domestic abuse that takes place. And it's not just children, it's spousal abuse. And there's a lot of uh, work in the Democratic Senate right now to make a, a real awareness and to leave a protection and a safety net for those people. So, as far as changing in, in legislation, uh, we got up to, uh, to uh, the, the family court to, to come to me. I don't have the exact uh, uh, the legislation. I don't know what maybe Ben has got some great ideas on it, and I'll, I'll listen to her. But when you get down to the Senate, you sit down and you debate about these things, and you look at the good ideas and what works. Too many times, these bills get altered. They get, they get placed into what else can we get and how else can we protect the wealthy. I've seen too many times I love that stuff. Thank you. Family court is a very, very difficult place where there are many, many heartbreaking stories. And there are several cases that will appear in family court. And many times what we see is custody issues and um, severed relationships. And there's nothing more important in family court than how children are treated and the outcome of the children who are involved in family court. So there is legislation that I am also supporting that requires mediation and parenting programs to try to resolve issues between disparate families, parents, so that they can do what is best for those children. Another great issue that is heartbreaking that comes before family court is domestic violence and child abuse. We have many pieces of legislation. We have uh, new legislation that we passed this year that increases the penalties for sexual abuse against children. I mean, there is nothing sadder or worse than to hear of someone taking advantage of children in that way. That's very something that we have worked on. Domestic violence, that's an issue that women have really brought to the forefront and that the legislature and the communities have responded to. There are many pieces of domestic violence uh, legislation that protect the um, location of the offended partner and all of them. I also have supported legislation that increases the ability for domestic partners to be heard in family court as well. Um, many, many sad cases, and believe me, there's no one who has a harder job, I believe, than a family court judge. So anything that we can do to help, the, help them and help the people who are in those situations, we try to do in legislation and all Thank you. This next question is for all the candidates. It's a little long, so again, I'll leave it up here. New York has the toughest laws on gun control, and yet we have the highest rate of crime and accidental shooting. What is your stand on gun control, and should we enforce the laws or make new laws? Mr. Brockway? This is a question I faced before I got a, a survey from the National Rifle Association the other, the other day, and uh, my father's a member of the NRA, and they're very restrictive on the type of guns that you can own, and they're right, the crime hasn't really been reduced, and instead of targeting laws for specific weapons, we need to examine the problem and see why the crime is rising, rather than restricting people that are enjoying hunting. Um, it's something that we've enjoyed in this country for many hundreds of years, and uh, I don't think that the crime has gone down or it has gone up, and as we keep restricting, um, it's, it's easy to buy guns in the black market, and uh, I think rather than, as I said, in, enforcing laws on people that are collecting guns, hunting, we need to do all that we can to make sure that they have the appropriate education 
we have to have the hunter mentoring program so that younger kids know the proper way to using a, 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 a firearm. And uh, it's all about education. If you educate people um, as to the proper uses, I don't think that the crime will be as bad as it has been. And I don't favor additional uh, legislation that would further restrict firearms in the United States. Although I do recognize the problem of crime. Mrs. Stripper. There's no doubt that the present laws have got to be enforced and they've got to be enforced across the entire state. There clearly is a, a huge group of people who tremendously drive and be married to somebody who likes to hunt. Um, and, and, and that should be protected. It has to be protected. Um, I agree that, that we need to teach young people how to treat, handle guns appropriately. I do have a real concern about some of the weapons that are out there on the market and that are such a danger to our law enforcement officers. And I think we, we need to enforce what's there, but I would also want to sit down with the law enforcement community, listen to their concerns, and, and take to the table what their concerns are, and if they feel there's a need, I would be open to it. I'm not aware of it at this point. That's part of the learning curve from the Albany. But I, I would truly trust the, the wisdom and, and concern of, of those who are out there on the streets, are on our roads, who are protecting us as residents, and are facing some absolutely horrible situations on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I have uh, studied this issue for some time. And I'm a member of the NRA, um, and I'm always, I, w when I hear from one source or another, because there are people who say crime's out of control, I recently read the book Freakonomics, uh, which did an in-depth study that crime is on the decline since, uh, since the beginning of the 90s. Uh, I know uh, since 9-11, certainly, uh, that there are border issues. Um, but uh, my stand on gun control is that there are, they are the toughest laws in, in, in the country and they should be enforced. Um, and I don't, I don't expect uh, that I would introduce any legislation uh, restricting or making tougher the laws that are there. It, I think that the big problem with, uh, with gun control is the enforcement of, of laws. I think a lot of people, a lot of people a lot of legislators uh, will have a knee-jerk reaction to one episode or another and ignore the fact that the person who committed this gun crime committed a crime. Uh, I don't know that taking guns out of the hands of law-abiding citizens will prevent that crime. It, it doesn't work in other countries, and it certainly uh, shouldn't be introduced here. Uh, and Eddie the Eagle is, is another program. I, I agree. It, it goes with that, uh, that NRA survey that we all got, but uh, I... I looked into the Eddie the Eagle program some time ago and it's, you know, it's a lot of it is education and, and yeah, but we should enforce the laws we have now. Thank you. Thank you. I too support the NRA education programs and their stance and have had their support. My four sons grew up and uh, had the opportunity to go hunting with their father and it's something that's a culture it's part of our Adirondack North Country living and they're not the people who are abusing and uh, not handling guns properly sportsmen are very well educated about the handling of guns it's the illegal trafficking of guns who come into the hands of criminals that we have to be more concerned about we've strengthened our illegal trafficking laws and we're trying to continue to strengthen those laws as we go forward the statistics do show that crime in New York State has dropped, although in some ways that's hard to see because we see crime rising in certain specific criminal activities. Um, but I know that our population in the state inmate facilities is down by about 10,000. So we are a state that is doing something about crime. We need to do more about illegal trafficking of guns, guns getting into the hands of the wrong people. Well, 
It is about education, of course. And sportsmen are very responsible. You know this. Let's again stop, step back. What is the cause? Why do you always want to put a band aid on a problem? For instance, Canada has the same per capita guns as the United States. How many murders? How many violent crimes do they have? They have much less disparity between the super wealthy and the poor. Whereas my opponent would strip away the estate tax, allowing the rich to become richer, shouldering the working classes to make us all poorer, creates the disorderly conduct that opens the door to violent crime. It is very difficult to sit here and try to balance everyone's needs. I don't believe in changing the Constitution. The Constitution says we have a right to bear arms. While Republicans in Washington would love to change the Constitution every chance they get. But I will say this. Trying to balance everyone's needs, the best legislation I've seen in a long time, was one that would penalize gun manufacturers for selling to, to gun uh, distributors that were known to break the law. Unfortunately, I have to say my opponent voted against that bill. I have to say that that was a terrible misstep. It is something that we can do productively to bring down violent crime, to make sure they don't end up in the hands of those that were used by the violent crime. So, you can do that. Again, we have a general question for everyone. What plans do you have to enable, enable our young people to have well-paying jobs staying in this area? And we'll reverse this time about the to begin. Me again. Jobs. How do we do it? Do we pay large corporations to come here and pay minimum wage? Do we give them the benefits? And we reap almost nothing back. No. What is it going to take to have jobs in our country? Jobs that pay. For one thing, we need infrastructure. We desperately need infrastructure. We've heard many people here tonight already talk about it. We need cell towers, not just the little ones along the highway that you get on there with the rubber plastic bag around it because it doesn't work. We need cell towers on all the county roads. We need to have good water and sewer. You'd be surprised at the number of communities who don't even have that. How will a company want to come and set up here or develop it here from within and they can go somewhere else and avoid the, the high cost of taxes? We've got to bring the taxes down. We've got to create an environment that's productive for small business. Small business is where the real community interests should lie because small businesses create something that stays in town. Walmart takes its money to Arkansas. It doesn't help us. Unfortunately, one of the largest problems facing small businesses right now is allowing health care for their employees. I'm sorry to say again that my opponent voted against a bill that would have created a pool, an insurance pool that small businesses could use to, to take care of their employees. You know that over 3 million New Yorkers have no insurance. That's a crime. It's a crime for the workers. It's a crime for the businesses. Again, we can't do better. Senator Little. Thank you. Jobs are very important, and they're important to the North Country. And seeing that we maintain the jobs that we have, that we help the small businesses be able to expand, has been very important to me. I've gone around and visited our different companies to find out their needs and how we can help them out. We've helped them out with training programs. We have empire zones. And it's easy to say that we shouldn't be doing anything on the government level to help companies out. But ask them who they hear from during the week. How many times they get a call from another state or another community with offers. We have to step up to the plate. We have to show them we provide an atmosphere that New York State is a good place to do business. 
We have um, power for jobs that we've been able to get for many of our communities because energy costs is a huge factor in businesses in New York State. Um, we have the single sales tax factor was passed last year. That's something that small businesses have been asking for for years. We were able to get that through. We have Healthy New York. It's a partnership insurance program for businesses that have not offered insurance and they can go and get their insurance through this company, through New York State. They provide premiums and all, but they provide insurance for their, their employees and they get the help from it. Uh, many of our companies will mention aerospace. Yes, we've provided some funding for them. A million and a half dollars I was able to get through the Senate initiative so that they would come to Plattsburgh. They're not minimum wage jobs. These people are going to start with 760 jobs and expect to grow to 5,000. We're working on why. We hope we have an answer soon, and we're trying to help that company as much as we can. Two biotech companies in Lake Placid, Biotech closed. These two groups are trying to say, we need these people to stay in this area. And yes, I'll do everything I can to help them get the funding they need to stay here. Mr. Nichols. Well, I believe, uh, the fun as I said earlier, the fundamental uh, uh, foundation for uh, growing the economy up here is to build that fiber optic uh, cable, to spread it around like a spider web across uh, this assembly district. Uh, and at the same time, supporting uh, our fine local education uh, facil uh, facilities like uh, Clinton Community College, North Country Community College, Paul Smith, and SUNY Plattsburgh, and providing a, a cost-effective education for every, every person who wants an education should have an education. And, uh, and we have to uh, support education, train our workforce, and the, just building the fiber optic cable uh, should be uh, providing a lot of jobs, and then there are jobs maintaining that cable, and then there are jobs uh, created by access to that cable. Uh, I don't think any, any modern business uh, is going to even uh, look at coming to the North Country without that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, infrastructure. Uh, certainly we've got a, uh, a, a new uh, facility opening up in, in Malone, ASAP PAC, uh, which uh, is a bio, not biotech, what they do, they uh, have seals, the guy has a patent on it, and uh, they, they have seals and it's medical packaging, and those are uh, $40,000 a year jobs, and what we have to do is support that kind of uh, uh, business and uh, also uh, help them out. I mean, the Empire Zone really didn't help him out. I remember the Empire Zone in our office was because uh, the way they threw it up in Franklin County, uh, they drew it around existing businesses and then I called up and said, how does this help me? And they say, uh, well, you have to hire X number of people. And it was almost like I would have to fire my entire staff and uh, hire them back on Monday in order to take advantage of that Empire Zone. So, I mean, growing the Empire Zone, uh, it, okay. Um, drawing the Empire Zone itself is, is a very political process and, and I, I believe that it's been poorly managed. And uh, if the Empire Zones are to work, we have to, we have to redraw the, uh, the maps, at least as they're drawn in, in Franklin County, and uh, just give our kids a reason to say it. We have to get a little creative and think out of the box, and, and one of the ways of doing that is, is to see exactly some of the programs and, and the funding that, that Albany has brought here, and in large part thanks to former Senator Ron Stafford and certainly the Senator Betty Lowe. Government does have to be involved if we're going to attract good jobs and if we're going to keep good jobs here. Um, certainly the Plattsburgh International Airport is an example of the federal government stepping to the plate with us as a partner and the funding we've received through Congressman McHugh and, and our other federal representatives. I think perhaps one of the best examples of, of cooperation is the Plattsburgh Aeronautical Institute with a collaboration between Clinton Community College, CB Tech, Park, the county, the state, the federal government. It doesn't get any better than that. And that will be successful. And part of the reason that Laurentian is coming here with their jobs 
is because of the input of all of the local governments to welcome them and to help fund them. It has to be a collaborative enterprise between private enterprise and government. Neither side can do it, nor should either side have to do it alone. The Empire Zones can and have worked very well in many, many instances. When I first started as a county treasurer, I was instrumental in starting the payments into a tax program known as pilots that have attracted businesses to the Industrial Development Agency and the Industrial Development Park that have helped to develop the park. We all have to work together. And when we work together, we will bring jobs here. We will keep our, our families here. And we will be able to bring families back. And a company like Laurentian that's coming in, and, and I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. Plattsburgh International Airport is going to help the entire 114th district because we're going to be able to provide a service that is not being used before. I'm proud to have been a part of it. I look forward to seeing the further development. Robert. Folks, the uh, sunlight behind the clouds in Plattsburgh back in 95 and it's coming out from behind the clouds again. Um, Plattsburgh Air and Auckland's to everyone here tonight and uh, Laurentian Aerospace, Top Aces was announced last week. We're creating jobs. We need to continue to create jobs. We need to share services. I know uh, the Senator has mentioned that before and between the town and the city of Plattsburgh there some town officials and town candidates here this evening, and I think that they're doing an excellent job, and that's freeing up some money that we can use to dump back into the economy, revitalize this area, and continue to keep our younger college graduates here because they're the future of the North Country. I know it sounds kind of weird coming from a 25-year-old, but it is, it is the future. We need to keep them coming back here, have them raise a family, have them work in this environment, have them put their tax dollars their hard-earned money into the 114th district so that we're doing all that we can to work as a community to expand the opportunities that have been announced in the recent weeks. Uh, it's getting brighter, we're creating jobs, we need to keep going forward, and I think that um, if the possibilities are endless. I think that this is going to be bigger than the Air Force Base. Yeah, one more question, and we'll take a brief and this one should be a little bit shorter. What civic organizations do you work for? Robert. Well, um, as you read in the paper last week, I'm a full-time candidate. In the past, I worked. For, I volunteered with Ducks Unlimited. Um, I worked for Senator Clinton. Uh, that's a political um, a job, but um, at my age, I think I have a lot of experience relative to. Um, people that are older than I am, and I think that I'm going to continue to work in civic communities. I'd like to join the Elks Lodge, much like my father did in the past couple of years, and uh, I look forward to becoming more active once I'm elected. Uh, as I said, at 25, I really haven't had um, that kind of uh, opportunity to join uh, civic groups, but I have a plan, I have a positive vision for the North Country. I look forward to working with our elected officials to make that plan come to fruition. And I think that brighter days are ahead, and uh, it's something that I'm looking very forward to working for. Mrs. How many minutes do I have? <laughs> I, I love this community. Um, I said earlier I'm in my 12th year as a member of the CBPH Board of Directors. I was the first woman to chair the CBPH board, chaired it for four years, um, and was treasurer of it for, I don't know, how many years. I'm a charter member of the Pine Harbor Board of Directors, which we will be opening in October. I hope all of you show up for that opening. We're so proud of that facility. Uh, 46 assisted living beds, uh, 20 beds dedicated to the care of early stage Alzheimer's patients. I've been a member of the Red Cross Board of Directors when we started the Lifeline program. I was a charter member of hospice prior to the time we even had certification to treat patients. In the 1970s, I was instrumental in writing a grant for Apple Valley Senior Housing in Peru, which provides 30 low-income senior citizen apartments for, for our residents. I'm a member and have been, I think, since the nursing program started at Clinton Community College, a member of the Community College Nursing Home Advice, or Nursing Advisory Committee. 
for, I don't know, 12 or 14 years, I chaired the board at the State Division for Youth Advisory Committee at the Escara Falls Youth Center. I've been a member for years of the St. Augustine's Finance Council. I hold the distinction of being the only lay woman to serve as a member of the Wadhams Hall Seminary Board of Trustees. That was an interesting experience sitting around the table with a lot of bishops. <laughs> uh, it was a great experience. Unfortunately, as you know, uh, the seminary closed several years ago and I was on the board at that time. I think I was on it for seven years. I've been involved in, in many of the organizations that my children have been involved in. And, and honestly, I, to stand here and list them all would, would take way more than the time I'm allotted. But I will summarize by saying I believe in this community. I've proven it by the the number of associations I've worked with, I will continue to be involved in organizations when I'm in Albany because that's what makes our community such a great place to be. Mr. Nichols. I uh, am a distinguished past president of the Kiwanis Club of Malone. Uh, during my tenure there, uh, we uh, I, I ran a bike rodeo and was uh, responsible for uh, raising money uh, to get helmets for kids and to teach them to go through the, uh, the stop sign and the, the yield sign and, and we'd have a police officer from along uh, down at the at the uh, fairgrounds where our stand is uh, directing the children. Um, during my time in that project, uh, we put helmets on the kids on the heads of uh, approximately. Uh, 2,500 to 3,000 kids. Uh, and what money uh, we couldn't raise from the community, uh, our law firm uh, donated to, to bring that number up. We always, whatever we raised from the community, our law firm doubled it so that we could uh, double up on the number of comments we gave out. Uh, it was easy for me to be uh, the distinguished president the year I was uh, in the Moral Quantum Club because that was the year of the ice storm. And so if, if what we did was um, interact with, interface with the, the, uh, the Qantas Club in Albany and they were talking about uh, shipping water up uh, from Albany and he really forced us to go out and, and find the source for this water because most of us didn't have a problem with water. It was, it was the ice we had a problem with and, and electricity but on the uh, reservation apparently the, uh, a lot of, of people depended on their wells and so there was a need for water. So we, we got that water uh, sourced up there, and then we drove a generator um, to, to people's uh, houses, you know, you know, people who live in uh, mobile homes so that they could uh, run their heater and, uh, and also heat the water so that they could take a shower. Um, after that, uh, and during that time, uh, we also were involved in a, in a huge fundraiser uh, that I headed up with uh, the Kiwanis Club and uh, the North Country Community College Foundation. Uh, we tried to get the Guinness World Book of Records for feeding the most spaghetti dinners on one day. Uh, it was quite an effort. I believe we made it. I don't think it's been acknowledged yet by the Guinness World Book of Records, but our mayor did certify it, and um, Sunday we did. Um, I'm currently a uh, elected officer at uh, the uh, Malone Lodge Belks. Uh, Tyler, I and uh, the uh, I also am the uh, district chair for the Adirondack uh, District for the Boy Scouts of America, uh, a member of the Order of the Arrow. Uh, we've done a lot uh, with over 2,000 uh, young boys to uh, to bring them up and teach them about citizenship and community citizenship in the nation. And I'm very proud of that work. And um, there are several others, but. Uh, I think I'm going to get gaveled down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as a mother of six children, and for 19 years I stayed at home and raised them. I was a volunteer in many, many organizations, including 4-H and schools and all of those things. Uh, currently, I am a member of Zonta, which is a similar organization to BPW, a business and professional women's organization in the Glens Falls area. I serve on the board of directors of Paul Smith's College. I also serve on the board of directors of Double um, H Hole in the Woods, which is a Paul Newman camp for terminally ill children and very, very sick children that's located in Lake Luzerne, New York. And I'm also a member of the United Grange, which I've been a member for a long time. 
But as a full-time legislator, I have several organizations that I've had to bow out of because I really can't make their meetings and participate at the level that I would like to. But um, I'm very supportive of all of the volunteer organizations. They serve our community so well and make the quality of life that we have what it is today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. How's me, Janet? Uh, where do you start? You know, there's always been that sense that um, we get through school, we try so hard to launch ourselves. I put myself in school. Uh, I didn't have the help of a family that, I, that many people are fortunate to have, and I kind of had to pull myself up by the bootstraps, one of those great uh, spaghetti western stories, but you always have to give back. It is what makes our community strong and makes them great. I, I sat on the board of the, uh, the Finger Lake School when my children were young. I, um, I, I was on the executive committee of the Unity Fellowship Church in, in Norwalk. I, uh, I, I was the, uh, the treasurer of the Connecticut Chiropractic Council when I was there. I was a member of, the, of how many professional organizations and here locally, the Chamber of Commerce and the Champlain Valley Morgan Forest Association. Has anyone heard that one? That's got to be a new one, right? Okay, but you know, how many people come to my office and they want donations for their causes? And they're all good causes. And, uh, and like, like the senator, I don't have a lot of time to always give. Uh, to, to sit on boards, uh, but of course, uh, you, you don't have. Uh, very proud to have just taken a, a temporary leave of absence from the Northern Adirondack County Parenthood, where I was chairman of the board. Um, it's a wonderful organization that, that allows so many young men and young women to get primary health care that they couldn't get anyone else because the funding allows them to be there. It's, it's a wonderful organization that, that prevents so many of the problems that they have criticized for. Um, I go down to Albany and I uh, advocate for, for the rights of women. Um, in fact, I've been to Senator Little's office several times. She didn't meet with me. Uh, but uh, that might be a, a philosophical objection. So, we all Every single one of us are very concerned. We're all very involved. And uh, I think all of us uh, represent our community as well. We will now take a brief intermission to give the candidates a break. <coughs> Seeing how I forgot who went last, we'll start at the beginning again. We are to end the program at 8 o'clock. So I'm definitely not going to be able to get through all of the questions. I'll do my best to get questions that all the candidates will be able to answer for you. And uh, remind everybody it's not a debate, and we're focusing on what our actions are. Which leads me to our first question. How do all the candidates feel about following Martha Rayville and signing a pledge to no negative campaigning? Senator Little. Absolutely. It's our responsibility to speak about the issues and the issues only and how we intend to deal with those things and uh, that let the voters decide. So absolutely, I would sign the pledge. Dr. Barrett. I guess I'd like to know what the definition of negative campaign is. Because it needs to be issues-based Everything we're talking about, all five of us tonight, is issues-based. Where do we stand on the issues? There are some times when I don't agree with my opponent, sometimes I do. I will not hide the truth from your barrel. I will not make comments about someone's personal life. It's none of our business. I absolutely believe in a positive campaign based on the issues, and based on the facts. Mr. Brockett. If it was uh, here right now, I'd sign it right in front of you. I think it's very important that we keep this issue based. 
Um, the campaign's kind of gotten sidetracked once in a while, and I think that it's important that we're going to talk about how we're going to provide uh, a better living for people in the North Country. It's, it's the most important thing that, as public servants, this is what we need to do for our constituents, and I would definitely have no hesitation in signing that um, proposal. Mr. Stewart. I just did a quick count, and uh, this is my 13th personal political campaign. I, I couldn't have time to count up the number I've been involved in with other candidates, but I can tell you that I have never had a, any kind of a negative campaign. I never will. I have won 12 campaigns by being positive and sp speaking about the issues, and that's how I intend to win the 13th. Mr. Nichols. After hearing all that, does anybody have a copy of this uh, document? I think we could sign it right now. I, I think it's an absolute uh, uh, injustice to the voters to uh, focus on things that are not uh, based on uh, a candidate's qualifications and abilities and skills and knowledge to run for this office. So, is, is the document here? Okay. If somebody could produce it, I'll sign it. Thank you. Do you have it? Okay, next question again is for all the candidates. In reverse order, and have Mr. Nichols go first. How do you react to the charge that the New York State Legislature is the most dysfunctional in the nation? If elected or re-elected, what do you plan to do about it? It is the most dysfunctional in the nation. Um, what, uh, fortunately, uh, with Elliot Spitzer, I've listened to Elliot Spitzer uh, quite a few times on, on the issue of uh, getting through the uh, garbage that we have to deal with and uh, and get a budget done on time. I, I, I firmly believe that if we as legislators cannot uh, pass a budget on time that isn't filled with pork for one fellow or the other and starts looking at uh, items that need to be uh, uh, justly uh, looked at and uh, either reduced or funded, there's a lot of money in the state and uh, a lot of it is just wasted. I, I believe the first step is just going down there and uh, standing toe to toe uh, and not not listening to uh, the uh, the pork barrel budget. We have to look at the the what's really just to do for the entire state. Uh, it's not you know we can't be looking at uh, we've got to fight you know the downstate urge. I, I, I think uh, we've all. Uh, been victimized by the, the downstate uh, people uh, taking a lot of the money uh, away from us. We certainly haven't seen a lot of those programs, and it's it's a tough question. Is there one thing that somebody can do? I guess is stand toe to toe uh, with the leadership down there and let them know that uh, we believe in the North Country that what's going on is wrong, and that we need to change it. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of it has to do with the voters. And, and the message the voters say to uh, to uh, electing uh, people who are who keep continually going down and not doing anything to change the uh, the way business is done. Like I said earlier, when it was a part-time legislature, it seemed to function pretty well. But now that it's a full-time legislature, it doesn't seem to function at all. So I think we just have to stand up for what's right and what's just, and uh, move with that thought in mind. As I was considering starting a run for the assembly, I, probably the only thing that scared me a little bit was the title of joining a group that's dysfunctional. Um, I, I think there's been too much power placed in, in just a couple of people. And, and I believe since I, I know that some steps were taken over the past year or so to 
to try and have more involvement of individual um, legislators in the committee system and, and in the negotiation systems. And that has to be the focus that gets moved forward. Again, I've spent 30 years as a consensus builder working with people of all parties. And, and, and I would hope that, that enough of us get elected that have a good, straight, common sense and a willingness to sit down at a table and talk about issues and work with each other, then the dysfunction will, will gradually begin to go. It's not going to happen overnight. It didn't get there overnight. Um, certainly there have been some major issues over the last few years to get budgets done. Um, more on time, uh, in a better fashion. And, and, and so steps have started, many steps have started, and, and we've got to start taking a little bit larger steps and, and, and get it fixed. And, and I, I want to be a part of the process. Uh, no one person has the answers to it. Um, so it's going to take a bunch of us working on it together. Mr. Bradford. Well, this kind of reminds me of the uh, great debate of 2004 when we had two candidates that had opposing viewpoints and one had a positive vision and one had a negative vision. We must work with all of the 115, or 150 assembly members in New York State. Two-thirds of the legislature is from below Albany and they control a considerable amount of the first strings. And I think that what Janet alluded to was the three men in the closed room uh, Speaker Silver, uh, Majority Leader, Leader Bruno, and uh, Governor Pataki, and we need to kind of decentralize that so that every member has proper input in the decision-making process. We need to elect like-minded people that have the same positive vision for their communities and make sure that we all have equal say. We're not the forgotten community up here. We need to elect people that are going to have a positive vision. They're going to fight for their community. Um, there's a, a great assembly member from St. Lawrence uh, County Region, Daryl Aubertine and I talked to him a couple weeks ago and we'd like to form a democratic coalition so that we can have a team from the North Country that can go down and negotiate with the leadership in Albany. Um, and it's also very important that we don't leave out our Republican counterparts as well. We need to all work together and have the best interests of New York State in mind so that we can restore some of the luster that's been lost and make New York State the entire state once again. Okay, I've been calm. We've got to talk fast. There's so much to say about this. We have so much work to do. First of all, let's just say Elliot Spitzer is going to be our next governor. He's working very hard. He knows the issues. I know I'm with them. I'm behind him. He's with me. We're going to do this. Now, first of all, let's look at this three men in a room routine. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. And the worst tragedy about it is it steals representation from you. You do not have a representation representation in either your assembly person or in your senator because of that. Joe Bruno, with the help of the Republican Senate, has changed the rules whereby you cannot make new rules without going through the Rules Committee. Who sits on the Rules Committee? Chair Joe Bruno. Okay? When the Democrats in the Senate push bills to say reform, 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 we want a joint legislative committee between the Assembly and the Senate so bills don't get sidetracked and forgotten. Motion to petition, denied. We won't even talk about it. We won't debate it on the floor. There are so many situations like this, okay? We need full representation. New York is among the most uh, backwards uh, legislatures. When everyone else is going to a much fully represented uh, government, we have lagged behind. What's it going to take? Well, I'll tell you what it's going to take in the Senate right now. You're going to help to elect a few more Democrats, and Joe Bruno, who has been gripping the power with an iron fist, is going to become the new minority leader. Well, being the only member up here who is a member of that legislative body, I guess it's appropriate that I'm last. However, I agree. There is dysfunction in Albany, and there has been for a number of years as far as the budget process. Budgeting in New York State Legislature has to be a negotiated process. You have to work with the interests of upstate New York who are best represented by the Senate majority, believe me. The Assembly Democrat and the Assembly in its entirety of 150 members, 65, are from New York City. So there are differences in how you want to negotiate things. 
For instance, there's a lot of talk about this rebate check and how it's not much to think about or anything. The STAR program took a number of years to negotiate. It is one of the best programs, the best helps for property taxes that we have had. In my district alone, $45 million last year were paid for by the state of New York for people's school property taxes. Our Senate proposal was to increase the, your STAR benefit by 75%. That would have been a substantial increase and you would have had substantial relief from your property taxes while we work on reforming that system. The assembly would not agree with that. Instead, they wanted the reduction in the sales tax on clothing of under $110. So the negotiation, the only way you can get it through and to try to get it through on time is to negotiate. The negotiated thing was a 30% star reduction re rebate check. And after you pay your school taxes in September, you will get the check directly back to you instead of the way it's been done. Um, and the other thing, we do have the clothing thing. We have done some reform. We have opened up the process. We have reformed the authority legislation, which really needed reform to make them more open. We just passed a bill that, so if you foil government and they do not respond to you and you take them to court, that government, they win, they have to pay your legal costs. That's a major thing. When you talk about dysfunction in Albany, there are many things that we did this year. We increased the DNA data bank so it's now all felonies and 18 misdemeanors. We strengthened Megan's Law so you have level two sex offenders online. We increased the DWI penalties and made it for repeat offenders, stricter penalties. Also, people who have a mobile, an alcohol content of 0.18, we increased the stronger penalties for sex offenders. We have done some things. There's a lot more to do. And yes, there is power in the leadership on both houses, and we need to spread that out better. I'm sure I can work with both parties, and I'm confident that going forward, I can work with the new governor, whoever he is. Thank you. Our next question, again for all of the candidates. Helping to find the causes of many diseases requires research. Why not support stem cell research? I do support adult stem cell research, and I think that that's right now is where many strides are being made. There are some ethical questions in regard to MDL stem cell research, and I think there's much more research that needs to be done before we take that leap or move into that. So I do not support embryo cell, stem cell research at this time, but adult stem cell research I do support. say that maybe it's a good idea, but the bottom line is the vote was cast against it. We desperately, desperately need this. This is not a matter of, of life and death. This is not a religious debate. This is a matter of science. It's a matter of survival. It is a matter of making our world better. I, as a chiropractor, for 15 years, I have dealt with a lot of people with neurological damage, people who have very little hope. And to tell them that there's a religious debate uh, that's going to prevent them from perhaps in their lifetime seeing something that they can only they can only dream of walking straight or seeing again. This is not a place for religion. It has gone far too far. I, I have my own religious beliefs, but they do not belong in government. We must remember our constitution. Remember where we came from and have a little compassion. Compassion that's more important than our religious views. Mr. Nichols. I spoke to a uh, breast cancer survivor uh, a couple of weeks ago and she uh, brought to me this, uh, the notion of the success of adult stem cell research, and that the adult stem cell research uh, has been coming forward uh, by leaps and bounds in, in the last few years. Um, and, and I support the adult 
stem cell research. I think that, that, that there are no ethical problems with that. I, I believe there's a difference between uh, uh, religious beliefs and ethical beliefs. Uh, I think that we've seen a lot from the adult cell stem cell research, uh, and certainly uh, I'm no expert on, on the field, but uh, sometimes you look at uh, federal programs and or state programs, and you kind of wonder about why are you know what's the fight about? Sometimes you know this embryonic uh, stem cell research could be. Uh, uh, based on uh, some biotech company out in California or well represented in the Congress uh, looking for a big chunk of money to uh, spend out their way. Uh, and, and I think, um, and that's uh, what uh, this discussion with this breast cancer survivor uh, was, uh, was part of. She, she, was, she was convinced that the embryonic stem cell research was, was all a group of uh, biotech companies trying to uh, get their hands on federal money and that's why she was so adamant uh, on uh, the adult stem cell uh, programs that are working and they are coming forward and they are providing great medical benefits to a great number of people. Uh, again, I, I, I see a, a difference between ethical issues and, and religious issues and uh, myself, again, I, I'm, I'm repeating myself so I'll get right off, but uh, I, I think that I have to know a whole lot more from experts to really come up with a firm answer to that, because there is some gut-wrenching emotional issues behind behind this particular issue, and uh, and I think we have to look at it calmly, rationally, and scientifically. And it's it's not it's not a, a us versus them issue. It's really about the ethical thing to do when we do it. This is good I do support adult stem cell research. I think it's critical. In uh, 1975, I lost my closest friend in the world because she couldn't get a liver. She had liver disease, and there were no options. Last night, I walked down to a neighbor's house and held the hand of a recent widow and, and let her son cry on my shoulder because my neighbor, the husband and dad, died during a liver transplant. Um, he rejected the liver that, that was put in him on last, last Friday. And it's very difficult. It, it was a tough evening. But I got to tell you, when I left their house, I thought, in 1975, it wasn't even an option. And we have come a long way. And we'll continue to progress. And we've done it through research, and we've done it with those means that are legal and that are ethical, and yes, that most religions abide by, and that's adult stem cell research. I support it. I've seen the difference in health care and what we can provide over the last 31 years because of that. I support both embryonic and adult cell uh, stem cell research, um, and I find it very appalling that um, President Bush's idol was uh, President, the late President Ronald Reagan, and his wife came begging to him to listen to the debate on embryonic stem cell research because scientists believe that this could possibly be more productive than adult stem cell research, and for him to claim that he couldn't support it, and I do believe it was for religious reasons. Um, there's a great debate amongst Planned Parenthood and the religious community as to when life does begin, and I think that by blocking embryonic stem cell research before you're properly um, examining the possibilities in the future for it, um, you're also blurring lines on that issue. Um, on when life begins to, so I think that we need to take a closer look at embryonic stem cell research. If the possibilities are there, move forward. If they're not, then it ends there. But I think that we can't rule anything out until we see the, po the potential possibilities. Although it is 8 o'clock, 
I will give you one more question for the candidate. And the question is this. How can we create a better society? Mr. Rockwell. It's uh, perhaps the most loaded question of the evening. Um, once again, how do you define better? I think that by doing things like we're doing tonight, having debates on the merits of the issues, um, what's going to benefit our community, what's going to make our standard of living a little bit higher than it was in the past. Um, having dedicated public servants such as the candidates we have before us here tonight, we need to continue having conversations, continue trying things and see what works and what doesn't. And um, I don't really have the answer to that question. I don't think, I, I think when the other candidates come up here, they're going to similarly struggle because uh, we, we, uh, we're not God, we don't know what is going to work and what's not, but to have a debate and bring it to the people and have us all work towards a better society, I don't really think that we're not going to make mistakes along the way, but if we learn from those mistakes and turn it around into something that's going to be a little bit positive, a little bit more positive than what we've been hearing in the past from our public servants, we always hear about the negative, we need to hear about what's possible, where we can go from here, and what's going to make everything in our society a little bit better and a little bit closer in this society. So I think, that while I don't have an answer, I think that I'm up here for the right reasons. I want to create a better society. Mrs. It's an interesting question. It has to start in the homes. We have to stop the throwaway divorces and making it so easy to, to just kind of walk away and then there's a few arguments. We have to smother our children with love, as that comes from a mother and a grandmother. But we have to get back to the basics. We have to, and, and religion has to be a part of it. Whatever someone's religious beliefs are, I truly believe that, that we have to instill it in our children. It requires education. It requires getting somehow parents back involved in their children from the minute they start preschool or kindergarten. How many school teachers and educators would tell you they have an open house and encourage parents to come and talk about their kids' progress and 10 out of 35 parents show up. So we have to start back at the beginning. We have to provide counseling services when people are in trouble. We have to encourage them to seek counseling. We have to take away the stigma of special needs children and mental health problems and open up our arms and welcome people in. And I don't want to sound sanctimonious, but I truly believe that the only way we get the end result of a good society is to start with our children when they're babies and encourage them through adulthood, but then not forget when they graduate from high school and go on to college that they still need support. And even more, maybe when they're starting to get married. And, you know, my son said to me the day my first grandchild was born uh, over 17 years ago, he said, Mom, I'm, I'm scared to death. Nobody ever taught me how to be a dad. And I said, yeah, they did, John. We started teaching you when you were born, and you know how to be a dad. And i got to tell you, 17 years later, he's a real good dad. And his kids say to him every now and then, Dad, we're the only kids in the whole town of Peru that have to sit at a, at a dinner table and eat dinner together. And he said, yeah, I know you're the first family since I said the same thing to my mom and dad. So I think, and I think that's what it's all about. And when we start doing that, then, then society's going to start to turn around. I have confidence in it. <coughs> Mr. Nichols. I believe that uh, to make a better society, we all start with ourselves to work hard and be the best person we can be. It doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes and, uh, and we're perfect all the time, but it means that we have to recognize our faults and not make that same mistake again. Uh, to instill in ourselves the, the truth that we can all be better every day in everything that we do. And also to expect from everybody around us to do the best that they can do whenever they can. And also to uh, take those, and it's not always easy, but to point 
especially to your children, because <laughs> you know, we do it all the time. Uh, to point out uh, uh, in, in firm but loving ways that you have to be better. You have to be a better person today. And as we, if we, yeah, and it is one of those those uh, things that you know it all starts inside here, and and we all have to believe that we can all we all have the potential to be good people, to learn from our mistakes, to do better tomorrow, to try harder the next day, and and it just keeps going and going because once you once you believe that, uh, you can do anything. I mean, and in this country, this is one of the uh, the only countries in the world where you really can be anything you want to be if you just be the best you can be. Anything you want to do, you can do. Anything you want to be, you can be. It starts, it starts with ourself. As Janet says, it grows to our family. And I, I hope that I have the same uh, good luck with, uh, with uh, my children. You know, uh, they come to me with uh, my 17-year-old grandson and, uh, and see the results of that kind of hard work. It's, it's it's tough, but it can it can be done. We just have to know that we have. To, it starts with us. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. I agree with you. It's a bit of a tough question. It's a philosophical question. So we're going to turn to philosophy. Let's look at Aristotle for a second. We have five branches of philosophy. The third branch of philosophy is ethics. And it's going to have a lot to do with who we are. And I think we could say what would make, what would help to create a better society in two words. Three, if you include the article. The golden rule. It may be something that's taught in certain religions, but it's taught in all religions. And it's taught in all philosophical debates. The golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And if you look at Aristotle, beyond ethics, based on building on ethics, you get government, you get politics. Politics should be the very embodiment of ethics. And when you talk about doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, you must make that inclusive. That is not do unto others as long as they're one type. When is our world going to wake up that we are not all the same? But we all have the same value, regardless of the color of your skin, your gender, perhaps your transgender. In government, our job is to understand that and to protect those who cannot protect themselves to reach out to those who are in need, to take care of each and every one of us, which is what our government is not doing. We have continually played to the rich. We have supported corporate interests. We have supported big money. It's time to look at the pie. And instead of, instead of breaking up that pie, for who can get it and who has the strength to fight for it. We have to start making our priorities. We all have values. They're not all the same, but each one of us has the same value. So, it's the golden rule. It does start inside Kevin. Janet, it does need to be taught in the home. And like Janet, I have amazing faith in both the American people in the American system of democracy. I'm really excited to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, we have several different answers and all fine answers as to how we can be a better society. And I'm sure each of you in the audience would have perhaps the same answer or a different answer and could add to that philosophical question. But I believe that what makes a good society is having people in your society who are able to live and have a quality of life. And in order to have a good quality of life, I believe you need education, health care, you need a job, you need to be able to have a safe society, 
You need to be able to have money in your pocket, discretionary money that you can spend rather than spending it all on taxes and handing it over to someone else. And I do think that government has a role. And I think that I, as your senator for the past three and a half years, have had a role. And my role has been to help those facilities, education, health care, and all of those, the companies coming in here, survive and help them to provide for the constituency that I serve. And I've done so by trying to get as much money out of Albany as I can get for the North Country. We have been able to continue to get money for funding a park for the redevelopment, 1.4 million every year, 5 million for the county this year for the flight line. We have gotten 200,000 for the um, Aeronautical Institute, which is going to help for SUNY Plattsburgh. I've gotten over $12 million in the last two years. Not for a new building, for a new electrical system, for the things that they need to operate. That's important because education, the economy, the jobs in this area, they're all connected. And if we don't provide that funding, and for those families to have more money in their pocket, this year, when you have children from the ages of 4 to 17, if you're single and your adjusted gross income is 75000 or less, a couple, 110000 or less, you will get a $330 tax credit on your New York State income tax for each child. And that's a refundable credit if you don't have any income tax to pay. Someone with three children is going to get $990 back, plus the property tax rebates. But those are things that help our families provide for each other and to have happy homes that aren't totally stressed out because everybody's working and everybody's trying to make a living and no one's home with the children. There are so many programs, CBPH, what a fine hospital. I've been able to get $500,000 for them this year. We've helped nursing homes to increase their reimbursement rate so they can provide for the elderly without breaking everyone's pocketbook. There are many, many other ones that we have. And, and the way I do it is I listen to the people in my district. What are their needs? The broadband, we're working on that. The cell towers, we're working on three cell towers at three rest areas on the north way. That has been the biggest frustration for me, trying to get that program through. You know, it's all visual, these cell towers. I have said I've never seen one I didn't like because health and safety are critical to our people. And they'll get taken down when they're not used. But thank you for your time, and I hope to be able to continue to serve you. These questions, but Jen wants to come up and make a concluding statement. I would like to add my thanks to everyone else's, for the people in the audience this evening, and also for our five candidates. They're putting in very long days, and they want to serve you. Thank you, Dr. Hickey, and I wanted to thank everyone that came here tonight to learn a little bit more about each candidate. And see what their personalities are like and what they're going to do for you. And I hope everybody learned something tonight. And remember, too, when you go to the polls in November, to September, September 12th is our primary, November 7th is our general election. And remember, um, the League of Women's Voters has some voter registration cards out front. If you are a registered voter, take one for someone that isn't and encourage them to vote. Because remember, the decision is yours. No matter what the candidate said tonight, it's your decision to make. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to thank Dr. Hagee, too, for moderating. <laughs> and I want to thank all of you as well, too, that came up with the thoughtful questions that concern you and showed the candidates tonight what your concerns are in this area. And I want to remember, too, that don't be afraid to look at people's personalities. This is one of my big, uh, one of my big issues, is that we all have loyalties to parties. We all have uh, people that we contribute money to. But remember, too, it's about the person. And you know, once the curtain closes in November, nobody knows where your loyalties were. So it's between you and another power, another being. So remember to vote for your heart and the person that you think is best for the job. Okay? Thank you very much. And uh, we hope to make this an annual event. So thank you for the Champlain Valley Business and Professional Women and the League of Women's Voters. And we'd like to hold another one again next year. Thank you.